Well, welcome to week 15. We are starting development two. We have a lot of content this week, so let's get started. Infancy. So last week we talked about fetal development. We talked about embryos to fetuses, um, start all starting with zygotes, and now we're hitting infancy. So babies learn through classical conditioning, through the development of their social and cognitive skills. Humans apparently have an inborn need for attachment. We've talked about attachment on Friday, so a lot of these terms should be somewhat familiar. We're going to go into later, uh, greater detail later today. Secure attachment, anxious, ambivalent attachment, and avoiding attachment are the three major types of attachment that some babies all face. Now, as we deal with infants, maturation is the unfolding of genetically programmed process of growth and development over time. We all have maturation, okay? We go from babies to children to teenagers to adults, okay? That's a maturation cycle. Now, for humans, the maturation starts at birth, technically, all right? At one month old, respond. babies can respond to sound, become quiet when picked up, and vocalize occasionally so they can sit in their crib and cry if they want to. In the second month, okay, a baby can smile socially, recognize its mother, roll from side to back, lifts head, and holds it erect and steady. Okay, so maturation. Month three, babies can social vocalize through smiles and talk of an adult, searches for sources of sound, and sits with support and its head steady. Month four, gaze follows dangling ringing, vanishing spoon, and ball moved across table, sits with slight support. Month five, a baby can discriminate strangers from familiar persons, turn from back to side, make distinctive vocalizations. Month six, babies can lift cup, bang it, smile at mirror image, reach for small objects. Month seven, makes a playful response to mirrors, sits alone steadily, and crawls. Month eight, vocalize up to four different syllables, listens selectively to familiar words, pulls into standing position. At month nine, we're gonna see a lot of growth. At 10, plays patty cake. 11, stands alone. One year, can walk alone. So this is the basic progression. And as you, when you have your own children later down the line, okay these are milestones that your children should be reaching so we said a baby should be able to roll from its side to its back in month two if your baby isn't doing that by say month four then it's good thing to go get a check because these are basic milestones that should all children should be achieving okay all right so what are the developmental tasks of infancy and childhood so what are they supposed to be doing Infants and children, especially important developmental tasks in areas of cognition and social relationships. Every day, they are constantly learning, developing the skills in which they're going to need for the rest of their life. Tasks that lay on the foundation for further, great, uh, further growth in adolescence and adulthood. They are learning the behaviors in which they are to respond. So if you teach a baby that if you do things and you're going to get positive reinforcement, then the baby will continue doing it. Um, teaching it how to behave and interact. Even though the baby can't vocalize your information back, they're constantly taking in all this information. So cognitive development, as we go through uh, infancy, the, uh, the, the baby's brain waves and brain activity triples almost every three months. The capacity of a baby able to think and its growth spurts are unprecedented. It, this is the fastest period that we grow as much as we do, especially in our brain. Cognitive development, the process by which thinking changes over time. At the very beginning, obviously, as soon as we're born, it's very simple. As we get older, it gets more and more complex. Schemes are mental structures or programs that guide a developing child's thoughts. Okay, um, a scheme <laughs> babies learn very quick is that if you cry, your parents are going to come see you or come take care of you and come offer you some comfort. Assimilation is a mental process that modifies new information to f 
to fit into existing schemes. So what is assimilation is where when a baby learns one thing and uses that information to solve information. So for instance, um, when a baby thinks that you know uh, a ball is always going to roll, when she sees a block, she's probably going to try to roll it just like a ball and be surprised. Assimilation. Taking new information, she's never seen a block before, she's seen a ball before, and she's going to anticipate. Eventually, she's going to realize it's not going to roll, and then her changing that perspective is assimilation. Accommodation is mental process that restructures existing schemes so that new information is better understood. So with that same scenario of having that bowl of ball rolling and that bl bra block, all of a sudden the baby's going to recognize, oh, this is square sides. Okay, it doesn't allow it to roll. This is different than a ball, even though they're about the same size. And you can hold them both in your hand. Okay, accommodation is taking new information to fix old ideas. Assimilation is taking old information and trying to make it work, even though it probably won't with the new information. One of the major cognitive psychologists uh, of all time for children is PJ. PJ has four major levels of cognition, sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational. All children go through these stages. There's typical uh, milestones in which people, babies typically achieve, but every single one of us goes through it. Now the sensory motor stage is from about birth to age two. A child relies heavily on innate motor responses to stimuli. So these are basic responses, okay? Uh, and with the noise, the baby's going to turn. With the sound of a voice, the baby's going to turn. Okay? Sensory motor. Basic foundations. Sensory motor intelligence. Okay? All of a sudden, the baby is starting to hear sounds, process that information. Uh, it's starting to process names and faces. Not names and faces, but sound of voices and faces. Starting to do the recognition. Mental representations, they're able to start processing information within their head. Object permanence, okay? They believe that if they can't see it, the, it doesn't exist anymore. That's why patty cake is so popular. Pre-operational, about age 2 to age 6 or 7, marked by well-developed mental representations and use of language. In the pre-operational stage, this is when we really start getting into language. This is when you start building your vocabulary at an incredibly fast rate. Okay? Egocentrism is a major aspect of it. It's all about you. It's all about that child. Okay? They are the ones who have it all. Okay? We referenced Big Daddy um, in class. You know, when he's playing that game, I win. Well, what's the rules? I win. Well, no, what's the rules? I win. Egocentrism. Animalistic thinking, okay? It's about getting what you need, what you want right now. And centration, okay? Everything around you is only the most important things, okay? Concrete operational is the third stage. It's from about age 7 to 11. Children understand conservation but is incapable of abstract thought. So they understand that what looks like a small amount in one jar can look like a lot in another jar, okay? But they can't understand abstract thoughts like imaginary numbers and, um, you know, the idea of true concept of peace. It's too abstract. You can't really process that information, okay? They need very concrete, very functional, very hands-on. Okay, conservation is something that they are starting to understand, and mental operations, going through one-step processes in order to get into more complicated understanding of information. Formal operational is from about age 12 on. It's abstract thought appears. Um, once you get to age 12, this is when you start getting into the more complicated issues. This is when you start caring about you know, peace, and this is when you start caring about, um, you know, religion and all that stuff, you know, what does it mean to be religious and all that stuff. That's all formal operational. It's all that abstract, high-order thinking. 
So as we continue to progress, we just don't develop cognitively, we just don't develop socially, we just don't develop emotionally. We develop all of this going on at one time. So you can imagine there's a lot going on in a little kid's head they don't even understand. So we just looked at PJ and his four levels. What we're going to look at is the social and emotional development. The theory of mind is the awareness that other people's behavior may be influenced by beliefs, desires, and emotions that differ from one's own. This may surprise you, but it's typically not till around age 8 or 9 that children actually start understanding this, the theory of mind. Before then, you think everyone has the same situation, everyone comes, like for instance, I came from a two-parent home. I assumed everybody came from a two-parent home. It wasn't until I was like 10 or 11 that I realized, oh, some people like only have one parent, okay? Or one people live with a grandparent. That's this theory of mine that I believe that everyone's experiences and emotions are very similar, when in fact they're very different. Temperament. Uh, is an individual's characteristic manner of behavior or reaction. My temperament is very low-key in regards to conflict, very high-strung in regards to work, in case you haven't noticed. Okay? Each child has a different temperament. Temperament is uh, something you're born with. You come out of the womb. Babies that are low-key and don't cry that often and sleep through the night are typically going to be very low-key children when they're older. Babies that are super fussy and constantly sick and all that end up being very high maintenance kids as they grow up. Okay? Zone of proximal development is the difference between what a child can do with help and what a child cannot do with any help or guidance. Now, this is different for every kid. Um, I was a very fiercely independent kid, so my zone of prox proximal development was very big. My sister, for instance, um, did not have a very large zone of proximal de um, development, which means she needed a lot of help and a lot of guidance. Okay? So it's a difference between one child and another. Socialization is something you're all very good at. It's a lifelong process of shaping an individual's behavior patterns, values, standards, skills, attitudes, and motives to conform to those regarded as desirable in a particular society. I can tell you that my own beliefs are totally different than what it was in fifth grade, totally different than what it was in high school to a degree. Um, I start seeing my personality today develop in my later years of college and you know as I get older and older I'm starting to see that it's continually changing how I interact and socialize with people um, the type of people I pursue now is different than I did in high school so socialization is a progression that evolves okay the person who you are today is definitely going to change even if you love yourself and think you're wonderful it's an exciting process to continually evolve and never stay stagnant. So, it's a lifelong process. Now, factors influencing a child's development may include effects of daycare, school influences, leisure influences, parent styles. Okay? So, I just, I flipped through a little fast. I'm sorry. Alright? So, when we look at what makes every kid individual, we have to look at all of these different things. For instance, children who go to daycare are typically a slight more independent than kids who stay home. Um, school influences, depending on what type of school you went to, whether it was a very suburban school or an urban school. Uh, leisure influences, I was always involved in sports. You know, my sister didn't like sports, so she would stay home. All of these deal affect who you are socially and emotionally. Okay, All of these are completely intertwined. And some more social and emotional development. Most approaches to child rearing fall into one or four parenting styles. Authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, and uninvolved parents. Okay? So there are many different ways we're going to address how to parent. Um, we're going to address this a little bit more further, a little bit further on. Now, Erickson is a huge set of theories that we are dealing with this week. He it deals with the psychosocial stages. He's looking at the internal conflict with our social self inside every child. All right. 
um, from to about a year and a half from birth to a year and a half we're dealing with trust mistrust now as we talked about with um, attachment that we need to feel like if we need our mother our mother would be right there or whoever we care most about that's trust mistrust the belief that if we needed them they would come and they would be there for us that's that argument at a year and a half to three years autonomy versus self-doubt um, from a year and a half to three children are trying to figure out is it better to be independent or is it better to is it independence or is it to hang by your mother and kind of stay there and rest carefully by her side so at that age we start seeing kids want to pull away but then don't pull away from the mom want to pull away don't want to pull away this is when we have a lot of oh you're a big boy now you're a big girl now that development of the child wanting to grow up but still holding on to a lot of things that you know they're uncomfortable growing up from three to six years old we're wor we're working on initiative versus guilt at this age we the child is moving on past the house okay usually they're starting to go to preschool day school wanting to socialize beyond their parents and that is initiative okay going out and seeing and talking to more people and being engaged in more people and the guilt is how can I leave my mother when she's been here for so long taking care of me that's the stage she, the child is dealing with I want to go out I want to see new things however how can I leave my mother what's she gonna do without me from six years to puberty it's confidence versus inferiority this is when we start having a huge social influence on top of it um, at this stage we're dealing with how do we feel internally and how does that compare to the external world um, this is all self-confidence and whether feeling worthy or not when we hit after we hit puberty we go into adolescence it's identity versus role confusion um, what we're struggling with is trying to figure out who am I like what do I believe what do I think you know it's kind of funny um, working in high school you see how people change throughout uh, a day, uh, throughout a year. You see people show up in rock outfits and all black, and then later on in the year you'll see them in a little bit more uh, preppy aspect. You can see how the changes, and that's the identity versus role confusion. What is my impact? How am I supposed to fit into these social roles? Early childhood is intimacy, ver early adulthood is intimacy versus isolation. Do I want to be in a profound relationship where I give myself wholly to someone or do I want to be young and single and date and go out in the world and conquer my dreams? Do I want to share my life with someone or do I want to pursue my own goals? Middle adulthood is generality versus stagnation. It is um, the creation of a family it is the looking back on your life and pursuing more goals or being happy with your goals okay and late adult is is ego integrity versus despair you're either going to look back and say I've lived a great life I've lived it up you know I've achieved everything I wanted to or you're gonna look back and say well I didn't do everything I wanted to do I'm really kinda bummed <laughs> Okay, so these are the major principles of Erickson. These are all psycho psychosocial stages that everybody goes through at different, uh, in different ways. Now, infants are born with an immature visual system, as we talked about in class on Friday. Okay, they can't identify your face right away. They can detect movement in large objects, but they can't de uh, decipher facial features. Other senses fluctuation w function well on day one. They can hear well, they can turn away from unpleasant odors, and they prefer sweet to sour taste. So all those things are intact. Um, senses are keenly attuned to people, helping an infant quickly learn to differentiate between the mother and other humans. Okay, So a baby recognizes or understands that the person feeding them or their mother is a very important person and they hone in on that. Now babies are not born defenseless. Their weapons of tools of sorts are called reflexes. 
A reflex is an automatic unlearned response. So no one sits there and teaches the baby how to do it. The baby is just born innately with this understanding. Rooting is the first uh, major response. It's the turning to a head and opening the mouth uh, to the direction of a touch on the cheek. The child is looking for nourishment or uh, looking for a nipple to suck. Um, as soon as babies come out of the womb, typically the doctors put them right on the mom's chest and they usually find the mom's breast right away and that's a rooting reflex. Sucking is sucking rhythmically in response to oral stimulation. Okay, they've been trained to do that. If you've ever put your thumb or finger into a baby's mouth, they are automatically going to start sucking on it. Okay, grasping, curling the fingers around an object. Okay, it's there to help start building up their connections. A Babinski is the fanning and curling of toes, one foot is stroke, the opening and closing of the toes. Moro, throwing the arms out, arching the back, and bringing the arms together as if to hold on to something in response to a loud noise or sudden ch uh, change in position of head. Now the Moro is the basic foundations of the baby uh, flipping onto its back. So that is a reflex. Eventually, as the baby gets stronger and is more durable, they will eventually roll over. Now, the physical development in infancy and childhood is very profound. Um, you grow faster, obviously, earlier in your life. Uh, for an infant, their first year is what we call an infant. A toddler is from year one to three years of old, and a child is the span between a toddler and a teen. So when we keep saying infant, it's still the first year. A toddler is from year to three, and a child is from three to uh, four on. So infancy and childhood. Now, as our brain develops, our brain's not, we're not born with a fully developed brain. We're born with a partial brain. Um, it's actually about 25% of its actual adult weight. Its birth weight, by contrast, is 5% of the eventual adult weight. By the end of infancy, a baby's brain will be 75% of its adult weight, but other body and height will be about 20%. So by the end of the first year of life, your baby's brain is 75% developed. That's it. But their body is only 20% developed. So you can see that a lot of the energy and creation in your body during the first year is going straight to that brain. Newborns enter the world with an estimated 100 billion neurons. After birth, the brain continues to develop rapidly. Okay, The number of dendrites increases dramatically during the first two years of life. Obviously, the more stimulation you have, the more interaction you have with that child, the more the dendrites and then more neurons are going to be firing and making connections. The axons of many neurons acquire myelin. The white fatty covering that increases neuron communications. So as the baby continues to grow, the more and faster and faster the myelin grows. On the left hand side you're going to see what a brain neural a brain image may look like of a baby at birth at three months and at 15 months. I mean if that says anything it should be make sure you feed that baby the best food they can get so they're getting the best nutrients to uh, build those brains. <laughs> you only get one brain guys. Pruning synaptic connections, okay, so we're looking at the neural development of the brain and how to make it more fine-tuned and how to make it grow. By age six, the child's brain is about 95% of its adult size, so its physical mass is at, by age six, almost 95%. Although overall brain size doesn't change during childhood and adolescence, dramatic changes uh, occur in the number of interconnections, okay? So it's not until childhood do we really start really processing information. Although our brain grows exponentially during our infancy, it's not until our childhood after age four that we really start creating the neural connections and the interconnections which allows us to use more information. Unused dendrites, somatic connections, and neurons are eventually replaced or rewired in order to be more continually used effectively. Infancy and childhood, motor development is a major aspect of infancy. Now us as humans, we're very motive, uh, we're very uh, able to move very quickly and freely. So the process is a little slow to start. One of the major processes throughout motor development is maturation. It is the biological growth process that enables orderly changes in behavior. Okay, 
also changes in behavior and movement. Um, we, you know, we don't just we'll get out of the womb and start running. You know, we we roll, we crawl, then we take our first step, and then we walk, and then we run. Maturation. Motor development includes all physical skills and motor coordination. The basic sequence of motor development during infancy is universal, but the average ages can be a little deceptive. Okay? It doesn't matter if you're born in the United States or if you're born in Kenya. Everyone develops at the same sequence, maybe not the same time. Each infant has his or her own genetically programmed timetable of physical maturation and development readiness to master difficult motor skills. What that means is, is that inside all of us, we are going, we hit our milestones at a different pace, but it's always the same pace. Okay, we hit milestones a little bit differently. No one's the same. However, we're all going to hit them in the same order. Now, the stages of motor development. One of the first things that we're able to do is lift our head, then it's roll over. We can sit propped up with head steady, sit without support, stands holding on, walks holding on, stands alone well, walks well. Okay, you can see that it starts very uh, basic and gets more complicated. Maturation of muscles. Uh, you can see that around age 15 months, they should be walking well. Social and personality development is a major aspect. Now, we did talk about temperament earlier. Temperament, you're, you're typically born with. If you're an easygoing baby, you're going to be an easygoing adult. A person's characteristic emotional reactivity and intensity. All right. If you look at me and Miss Abar, I am way more high-strung than Miss Abar. However, me and Miss Glover are much more similar. A child might be described as an easier or slow to warm or difficult baby. Temperament shown in infancy appears to carry throughout a person's life. So if you ask your parents, how were you as a baby? Oh, you were such a pain. You wouldn't shut up. You wouldn't let us sleep. You're probably going to be a pain for the rest of your life. <laughs> but ask them about it. It'll be pretty insightful into your probably your personality today. Temperament has a genetic and biological basis. But that environment experiences can modify a child's basic temperament. So the reason why we have a temperament is so we have a level playing field in order to deal with situations we don't understand. Okay, that's why we have a temperament. However, temperament can be affected by our environment. It is genetically tied. However, it can be affected by the environment, nature, nurture. Um, when we deal with temperament, we're dealing typically with easy, which is adaptable, positive mood, regular habits. Okay? Um, when we think about this, we could think of a famous celebrity like, oh, I don't know. A comedian is typically an easy, adaptable, positive, regular habits. Um, like Jerry Seinfeld. Everyone loves Jerry Seinfeld. Slow to warm up is low activity, somewhat slow to adapt, generally withdraw from new situations. I would say that's probably me. <laughs> Not much of a social person. Difficult, intense emotions, irritable, cry frequently. Um, you know, I would say this is uh, Britney Spears right there. <laughs> intense emotions, irritable, cry frequently. Got a bit of the crazy. Um, average unable to classify one of three of all children okay which means they're a whole mixed bag of everything okay so which one are you think about it infant attachment it's an intense emotional bond between infant and caregiver most typically the mother attachment theory is an infant's ability to thrive physically and psychologically depend on part of the quality of attachment they have with their mother Infants can form multiple attachments to multiple different people. The important thing is that the baby does form a secure attachment with a caregiver of some sort. There's many different forms of attachment. Not many, there's three different forms of attachment. Securely attached, which explores the room when a mother is present, becomes upset, and explores less when the mother is not present, shows pleasure when the mom returns. All right, we showed a video clip demonstrated this for you should help with clarification. Uh, other forms of attachment is insecure attachment. 
becomes extremely distressed when the mother leaves the room and when reunited are hard to soothe. Okay, very uncomfortable. Two types of insecure attachment. Avoidantly attached. A form of insecure attachment in which a child avoids mother and acts coldly to her. Okay. Um, this is the kid who doesn't care if the mother comes in, comes out, leaves, stays, goes, doesn't care. Anxious resistant attachment. A form of insecure attachment where the child remains close to the mother and remains distressed despite her attempts to comfort. So even the mother leaves the room, the baby's screaming, crying, the baby comes back. And the kid is just continuing to scream and cry and make a scene. Okay, anxious, resistant. Now, another major theory for parenting stop parenting styles and all that is Ainsworth. Um, she observed uh, children in a playroom under four conditions: uh, the initial mother-child interaction, mother leaves the infant alone in playroom, friendly stranger enters playroom, and mother returns to greet child. Study done with infants between one and two years old. Her results were very surprising. Secure attachment predicts social confidence. So when we talk about attachment, we talk about secure and insecure. And, um, but what Ainsworth did is see that the long term, the more secure the attachment, the social end and the long term attachment. Deprivation of attachment is linked to negative outcome. A responsive environment helps most infants recover from attachment disruption. Okay, so is there a way to really recover from poor attachment to your caregiver? Not really, but being in an environment that constantly feeds off you and allows you to boost your self-esteem can actually help improve. Now, percentage of infants who cry when their mother's left. Okay, blue is daycare, uh, red is home. We can see that the children at home cried way more than children in daycare. Um, I would anticipate that as, you know, uh, children <laughs> who go to daycare typically have parents at work and can't be home while kids at home typically have a mom and mom or dad that stays home all the time. Stranger anxiety, the fear of strangers and infant displays around age, uh, around eight months of age, okay, they cannot be away from their mother, they have to be near that safety blanket. Attachment, Harlow's monkeys. Okay, attachment is an emotional tie with another person resulting in closeness. Okay, as we watched it today, we saw that it isn't the food and the, the food that keeps us close to our parents. It's the uh, feeling of security. Children develop strong attachments to their parents and caregivers given to the sense of the security they provide. Body contact, the limit, full, the limit <laughs> and responsiveness all contribute to attachment. So, being there consistently, being around consistently, okay, and having that body contact is what makes attachment so powerful. Now, Harlow's monkey, it's inf uh, infant rhesus monkeys were placed on two surrogate mothers. One was made of wire, one was covered with soft cloth. Milk producing nipple was attached to either the wire or the cloth mother. Attachment was based on contact comfort rather than feeding. Okay, as we saw in the video, we're going to notice that the monkey would eat off the wire, mon wire monkey, but seek comfort and hang out most of the time with the cloth mother. Even though the cloth mother could do nothing but give it a sense of comfort, the baby preferred being with the mother than it did with the wire monkey. Alright, the monkey spent most of the time on the cloth, cloth mother. Time infants spent on cloth, we can see, okay, clearly it's the cloth, okay? So, the more the monkey stayed, okay, the less likely they're going to be happy without the mother. Flim, uh, so, a sense of contentment with that is already known. Infants are familiar with their parents and caregivers, so we like things that are similar or familiar to what we're expecting. So we like people that we see continually. We feel comfortable around people we see. All right. And we also babies also like looking up and seeing a face that looks like their face, or looking at faces that remind them of their faces. One major process we're talking about this week is imprinting in critical period. It's a process by which certain animals early in life form attachments. Now humans, we do it by Harlow's monkeys and 
seeing the relationship and being cared for and having those feelings, okay? But animals do it a little bit differently. An imprinted behavior develops within a critical period, an optimal period when the organism's exposure to certain stimuli produce the imprinted behavior. What that is, is usually in the first couple hours of birth, that is the critical period. Whatever information is learned then is the basis of all other information. Conrad Lorenz studied imprinting. Okay, He studied imprinted behaviors. Gooselings are imprinted to follow the first large moving objects they see. So when they come out of the egg, they look up and whatever they see is what they follow. Okay, So here's Conrad and his gooselings. He was the first thing they saw when they were born. So here are the geese. Their gooselings are just following them around. All right, raising psychologically healthy children and parenting, a parenting style is the major tie we have to this. Responsiveness are responsive parents that are aware of what their children are doing. Unresponsive parents ignore their children helping out when they want to. If you go to a playground, you're going to see both of these. Responsive parents are the ones who are sitting on the bench. You don't have a cell phone in their hands. who are just watching their kids, you know, monitoring their kids, getting up when they can't see their kids, calling their names. Unresponsive parents are the ones who are, hen are head in their book or, you know, it's not really their book, but the parents who don't want to be disturbed. They're the parents on Sunday who don't interrupt their football and don't want to have anything to do with it. Now those are kind of light-handed examples. It's more severe than that, though. Bomrods came up with three different types of parents, authoritarian, authoritative, and permissive. Authoritarian are value obedience and use a high degree of power assertion. Think of it as authoritarian as an army. You do this, you do that, that's all. Authoritarian. Authoritative is less concerned with obedience rather than the use of induction or rather the use of understanding the value of what you're doing and the long-term implications. Authoritarian, you do as you're told. Authoritative, you understand why you're doing it. Uh, understand the bigger connection. Permissive, most tolerant, least likely to use discipline. Those are the parents that in high school, those are the cool parents. You know, they have the parties at their house. They're the ones that their kid can stay out to all hours of the night. Nah, not a great parenting style. And uh, we'll see how it affects their children. Neglectful is completely uninvolved. Those are the kids whose parents are never home, don't care, um, and, you know, just almost abusive neglectful. Now, the basic parenting styles, parents who are authoritarian, okay, are demanding and unresponsive toward their children's needs and wishes. Those are the army type style. Okay, the parents want this, the kids will do that. The parents want this, the kids will do that. There's no voice of the, of the child. Parents with permissive parenting styles may be permissive, indulgent, extremely tolerant, not demanding, and responsive to their children. Or permissive and different, which is extremely tolerant, not demanding, and not responsive. So, they may be indulgent, giving in to their child, doing whatever the child wants, a perfect example is for Mean Girls. It is um, the girl's mom who really not Lindsay Lohan's character, the other girl, and you know who hangs out with all the girls, trying to be just cool, just as cool as those girls. That would be indulgent, uh, permissive, indifferent. Is a parent who is constantly away and is unresponsive, not demanding, and extremely tolerant of the child's behavior. Parents with authoritative parenting styles set clear standards for the child's behavior, but also responsive to their child's needs. These are the parents who say, all right, this is the curfew. You need to be in by curfew. However, if your child calls you and they're around the corner and in order to get there safely, they're going to have to be a couple minutes late or say, okay, well, drive safely, but, you know, we're going to have to have a conversation about that. Authoritarian is you do this, you do this, there's no conversation. Permissive is, well, just do what you want, it's fine. And authoritative is, this is the expectations, these are what you should have done, um, 
what do you, I mean, is that fair? And having a conversation about it. Authoritarian parents are low in warmth. Discipline is strict and sometimes physical. Communication high from parent to child and low from child to parent. Authoritarian, army, maturity, expectations are high. Okay, very structured, very military-esque. Permissive is high in warmth but rarely disciplined. Communication is low from parent to child but high from child to parent. Expectations of maturity are very low. Typically, we get it confused. We think that if a parent doesn't care, our child is going to become more responsible. It's actually quite the opposite. Very few children who grow up with permissive parents actually become very full-functioning children and very independent ones. Authoritative uh, parenting style is high in warmth and moderate discipline, high in communication and negotiating, Parents set and explain the rules. Maturity expectations are moderate. So maturity is they're expecting appropriate behavior for their age, but not too much. Parents set and explain the rules and have a conversation about it. High in communication, it goes both ways. Setting an example, communicating. Uh, high in warmth and discipline. Things are going to be explained. Things are going to be clear. Okay. The effects on children dealing with your parental style is huge. Children of authoritarian or military style parents are likely to be moody, unhappy, fearful, withdrawn, unspontaneous, and irritable. This style promotes resentment and rebellion. So if your parents are very military style, very old school, those are typically what's going to develop because of it. Children of permissive parents tend to be immature, impulsive, aggressive, and they may never learn self-control. How to regulate their own uh, desires typically never become learned. Children of authoritative parents tend to be cheerful, socially competent, energetic, and friendly. They show high levels of self-esteem, self-reliance, and self-control. So just looking at this, what type of parent do you want to be? <laughs> Hopefully it's pretty clear. Suggestives for being an orth uh, orth authoritative parent. Let your children know that you love them. Listen to your children. Use induction to teach as you discipline. Explain why you're doing things. Don't say, because I said so. It's the most infuriating thing. Work with your child's temperament qualities. If you know your child is very um, high strung, then go for a very low key aspect. Understand your child's age related to their cognitive abilities and limitations. Children can't do everything at all ages. Okay, they can only achieve certain things. So you shouldn't be asking a five-year-old to act like an 11-year-old. You shouldn't have the same expectations. A three-year-old can only do certain things and understand so many things. So just be clear and understand the expectations. Don't expect perfection and learn to go with the flow. Okay, so this is just a graph demonstrating that authoritative parents is the best way to go. Hopefully that's convinced you. All right, well, that's the end of this. I hope you all do wonderful this week. It's a lot of content, a lot of information. However, I think it's really interesting stuff, and this is absolutely useful in your future life. Anyway, I hope you have a great week. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on YouTube next week. See ya.